It's with great pleasure that I invite, uh, shortly I'll invite Clarence Slocky to the stage. Um, a couple of years ago, I was very fortunate to be able to visit a garden that Clarence designed. It was a rooftop garden on a Mervac building in uh, the Sydney CBD. It was this spectacular garden and um, of, of native plants, of course, and bush food plants. And in such tough conditions, as you know, rooftop gardens are, uh, you know, there's a whole consideration about the soil and the lightness of the soil and how much water it can absorb and there's wind, etc. And just, just so a spectacular garden. So they are, are planning to reopen that garden again soon. So if ever you have the chance to see that, I would very strongly recommend it. But it kind of made a profound impact on me, this absolutely beautiful garden in these quite tough conditions. Clarence is a uh, Kajinbara Bundjalung man from the Tweed Valley. Hope got that that pronunciation right. He brings a passion for both art and design into everything that he does, including being a TV presenter. Um, he uh, he runs his own business, landscape design business, and stri strives to combine indigenous culture into green space urban design. So we've asked Clarence to share with us a day in the life of the First Nations people. So please welcome Clarence to the stage. Oh, good afternoon, everybody. Hi. Oh, they tell me uh, television puts about 10 kegs on, but uh, it's actually me to put the kegs on, not the television. But, uh, but uh, yes, uh, a day in the life. Um, I might add that uh, if you if you are doing uh, urban green space, um, it's not just the wind and the conditions. Uh, we're almost finished. We just put 2,000 plants in a 500 square metre space. Now, there was this weird smell. And I thought, what is that? I know that smell. And I followed my nose and in the, the back corner, you know, and most of the plants were tube stock, so it wasn't like, a, you know, you could hide this thing, but you know, I walked over and there was this small, that, literally that round, and the smell was overpowering. So I know what that is. So I got a spade and I started digging, and as you went down, it got bigger and bigger. One of the subbies decided that uh, he had paint thinners that he had to get rid of. So I was like, like we're on a roof. It, it goes down into a drainage cell and then it goes down into a holding tank. It's like, man. Anyway, pee boy. <laughs> so so uh, a day in the life. Uh, when, uh, when I was asked to, to come along, I, I uh, do love the, uh, you know, the Australian native plants or the Australian Plants Society in New South Wales. Well, I do that right. You know, um, I, I'm all about natives and trying to change the conversation for particularly for designers, landscape designers, architects, landscape architects, why we don't grow more natives in public space, I just cannot get it, but anyway. Um, a lot of us to do with the ongoing maintenance, so yeah, let's just put philodendrons in it, do they? It's easy, yeah, I think. but they don't really serve much purpose, do they? They don't help the pollinators, there's no urban biodiversity, so be that as it may, we're trying our best, you know, one garden at a time to try and change that conversation. Um, and a lot of it comes through um, my own cultural knowledge, and I'll, I'll try and tie that into the, the stuff that I am going to talk about today. The, uh, you know, you've probably all seen this map before. Um, it's not a definitive map of Aboriginal Australia, but it's the best we've got at the moment. There are some um, language groups that have been missed off this map. Um, and when you talk to the people who've been missed off the map, they're not happy about that either. Um, but, you know, uh, contrary to popular belief, there are Aboriginal people in Tasmania. Um, by and large, Aboriginal Australia is the mainland Tasmania, the Tiwi Islands, Mornington Island, some of the islands off, the, off of uh, WA. Um, and the, the, I did uh, enjoy the previous uh, speaker and talking about, you know, 65,000 years, forever. 
might as well be forever. We've been here a long time. Um, but you, when you, you listen to dreaming stories, and there's a, one of my, well, there's quite a few favourites, but there's one about the Great Lake, and the Great Lake was, you know, is now the Gulf of Carpentaria. I've been lucky to have lived and worked in remote communities, um, North East Arnhem Land, Mornington Island, um, all up in the Gulf Country, up to the tip, up into the Torres Strait. I've been really lucky to have travelled to so many Aboriginal communities and Torres Strait Islander communities. Um, and the big problem for a lot of uh, communities, obviously, is just getting there. You know, they don't call them remote communities for nothing. Um, and, you know, on a, a, it'll kind of tie into what I'm going to talk about, but when I was on... Um, I went to Mira, which is Murray Island, the birthplace of Uncle Eddie Koikimaba, and uh, he, um, as you probably know, the, the, the whole uh, thing about Terra and, you know, land belonging to no one, and um, the, the, the Captain Crook quite, Crook, can I, can I just say that name? Crook. <laughs> anyway, you know the fellow. Um, so he renamed our, our uh, sacred mountain, which is Wollumba, and he renamed that Mount Warning. So anyway. Um, but the, yeah, the, the, the Torres Strait, um, and this was back in 1999, um, the last time I visited that island, and to buy a pineapple was $15. To buy a watermelon was $30. And it's all because everything's got to be f come over by barge from Cairns. So it comes over and, and it's, it's very, you know, they were starting community gardens. Mare is a bit tricky because it doesn't have its own um, private water source. And there's, there's dreamy stories about that island as well. But um, when we talk about a day in the life, um, I did actually speak to somebody a little bit earlier. Um, you know, you can kind of, this is breaking that map down, bunge along where up the, up the top, get the ball of the, they're the, like the Western mob. They, they sit on the, on the, uh, the shadow side of Wollumbin. Um, but Wollumbin is our dream. You can pretty much see it from anywhere around where, where I live up on the Tweed. Um, we do have a, a, a state border running through um, Bundjalan country, um, but I'm, I'm born on the good side, the blue side. Um, <laughs> so, so we're all Tweed Byron. Um, my, uh, well, certainly my great grandparents, I've got an uncle, Clary, um, great grandfather, Clarence, and then of course the Clarence River, which is the southern border of Bundjalung. Um, but you know, people ask me, why, yeah, what's your name, Clarence? So, well, funnily enough, growing up, everyone just called me John, which was, oh. my, it was my middle name. So, you know, I thought it was far more, uh, you know, stately to have the word or the name Clarence. So, you yeah, know, everyone knows me as Clarence now, or Clary, or Slock, or Slocky, <laughs> and other names that Sharpie mentioned. <laughs> um, but, you yeah, we're, we're here on, on Durrell country. Um, one thing I do really, really love about uh, you know, Aboriginal culture is it's not one thing, it's not one culture. Um, you know, I'll, I'll get people come up and say, and um, a good friend of mine, her, her daughter named her her daughter, which was my friend's granddaughter, Araluan, and she goes, oh, you know, it's this beautiful name, you know, it means water lily. And I say, you know, do you know the word? And I was like, no. Like, there's like a thousand different languages. Like, uh, and Araluan is from uh, Aranda country, um, not on this map obviously, but Aranda is you know, around Alice Springs and the, around Little Roo. So Aranda is um, just one language among many. Um, even in Bunjilong, we've got um, several different dialects. Um, I, have, I was just reminded actually that um, I was part of the National Choir this year um, and uh, following in the footsteps of uh, um, Deborah Teeth of Mayo. Um, and luckily, Deborah is a good friend of mine, but she is a far better musician than I. Um, as a musician, I'm a pretty handy gardener. <laughs> um, but it was, it was a fun project using, uh, using different Aboriginal languages and talking about Aboriginal seasons and seasonality. So we talk about um, Thurwall, some of you may have seen the Thurwall seasonal calendar. Um, and again, I was talking to someone over lunch about the, you know, just turning the Northern Hemisphere um, calendar upside down and, you know, it's more con for convenience sake. The 1st of September, yep, that can be the first day of spring. Just makes it very easy. But as you all know, environmental factors play a big role. Things happen differently. You know, I've used to love you know, all the all the neighbouring farmers, all the especially all the old fellas. Oh, yeah, it's late spring, you know, or is it early summer? Yeah, anyway, um, but you know, it, it's all about 
what's happening in the environment. And that, uh, you know, some of the things that we did as kids, you sort of, you know, the, this, um, I actually noticed that image there. I'm lucky I didn't put that image in my, uh, in my PowerPoint, but it's from a very good book, Learning Darn Gutter, um, Living in the Illawarra. If you haven't got a copy, check it out. It's available in PDF. <laughs> I don't know the website these days, but it was the old OEH which was, of course, the old DECCW, and then it was DEC, and then it was DECC. <laughs> the government has now Stobie. It's true. Department of Planning, Infrastructure, and just so you remember, Environment. Dobby. Okay. So you can track, track this book down. It's a, it's a great book. It's got lots of language um, words for a lot of the, the plants around the Illawarra, a lot of the animals and birds. That would have been part of the uh, the, um, the diet for a lot of local mob. And you know, as a Bundjalung fella, I can't speak for country, but I'd be uh, living in the Illawarra. I do love the place. It's a, you know, unfortunately, I have to work in Sydney, but you know, I get to come back down the uh, down the, down the down the road and um, enjoy what is a beautiful part of the world that was a secret a little while ago. Now everyone seems to be moving down here. Uh, what can you do? Um, so there's just a, an, an example of just some of the, the tools and weapons used by Aboriginal people. Um, the image on uh, your left, stage right, um, is from the Australian Museum, and it's a lot of the, the Sydney. Um, a lot, some of these are actually held at the museum. I was lucky enough that uh, one of my mates works there, and she took us into the back. There's a whole heap of stuff on, in storage that just uh, just, just mind boggling. Um, Sadly, a lot of early artefacts from the Sydney region went up um, in smoke when the Garden Palace, uh, which was at the Royal Botanic Garden, Sydney, burned down, um, which is a terrible, terrible loss for uh, not just for Aboriginal people but for all of us as Australians. Um, you know, some of the things on the on the uh, the, the image on on uh, your right. Uh, you know, different boomerangs are used for different things. Uh, most of these are made out of mulga. Mulga is one of my favourite woods, as is Gigi. Um, a little known timber that makes great clap sticks is the Quandon. It's a milky white, just beautiful. Um, and if you're going to use um, oil, linseed oil is good on a mulga. Don't use it on, um, what's the word? Having one of those moments, Peter. Quandra, thank you. Yeah. When I used to teach, it was, uh, you know, especially the high school kids, you say Quandra. <laughs> anyway, I <I'm> digress. <laughs> but, uh, but some of the things, the, um, the, a, lot of the, a lot of the words that we, we uh, know, you know, things like kookaburra, um, Wumro is an interesting one. So on the left hand, uh, yeah, your left hand image, the far right of that left image, you can actually see the Wumra. It's used to throw a spear, so the Wumra fits into the, 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 um, the spear. If you're holding a Wumra, your arm is twice as long, and you know, mathematically, it means that you should be able to throw that spear twice as far, and it's a lot of fun using a Wumra. Um, you know, as a side note, the uh, Australian government are looking for a name for a missile launching range in South Australia. <laughs> Yeah. That sounds like a good name, Woomera. So yeah, but it's a Sydney language word. Um, kangaroo is an interesting one. That was uh, when Crook again put his boat on the reef. He had to go in, you know, it wasn't the Endeavour River then, but you know, they had to patch the boat up and um, in the Gooby Island they call him is Gangarook. And kangaroo was sort of the anglicised version of it, I suppose. There's no right or wrong spelling of Aboriginal words. It's, it's really about the sound. Um, and then, you know, in Yongumata, which is northeast Arnhem Land dialect, they, some of them, some of their words are just so beautiful because they're just so simple. So they're, like, there's a, a, the name for a crow is like a formal name for the crow, which is Galparingu. But the easy name for the crow is literally the sound he makes is called wak wak. So if you slow it down, it's wak wak. <laughs> of course, uh, and, and um, the wallaby up there is called Dum Dum, and it says, uh, it's just, it makes it so easy to remember language words. Um, the, you know, the, the more annoying bird is the, uh, the seagull, which up there they, they call him uh, 
well, they don't say that, they say Jack, but you know, you can hear him. Jack, Jack, Jack. But you know, I'm, <laughs> language is intrinsic for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. We are losing our languages at a really fast rate. And we're also losing as, as living languages because the, the fluent speakers of particular languages are no longer with us. So luckily for us in Bundjalung, there are a lot of, a lot of our younger people um, who are getting right into it and, and bringing it back. Um, quite a, a couple, of, couple of nephews, um, I'm probably speaking to the wrong room, but I don't know if any of you have heard of JK47, maybe not. Anyway, he's a young nephew. Mad rapper, he's really, really good. Um, <laughs> and a, a couple of other young, young fellas who are all singing in language, um, kicking really big goals as, as musicians and singers. Um, way younger and way better looking than me, so they're doing a great job. Um, but a lot of these things, you know, when we talk about a day in the life, the, you know, you, you basically, yeah, we've got it easy these days. One of my um, mentors who's no longer with us, but uh, the, the departed John Lennis once said to me, he said, you know, these white fellas, they got all the up. You know, they work, or work. Like, as soon as you leave school, you work. And then you retire so you can go fishing and hunting and bushwalking. So we, did, we, did, we, did, we did that all the time. <laughs> and that, was, that was our job. You know, just you know, get out of the bush, you know, fishing, you know, gathering food. So, you know, it you know, makes perfect sense to me. Anyway. Um, we have to live in the society that we have. But you know, having to create these things, it's you know, the, the dilly bag that, that you can see at the top there, the green one, I, um, I can weave, but I am really slow. It's a beautiful social experience. You just sit around with the aunties, weaving around, and then you sort of, you know, by the end of the day, I'm lucky to have something this big. Um, but yeah, you know, it's fun. It, it's, it's really nice to do. But if, you, if you're doing that, and a lot of the, if some, some of you may or may not have or seen or have a big wall hanging of a, of a um, woven, so normally up north they use pandanus, down here we use lamandra and gumbungi, some of the, the different reeds, but like it takes a lot of effort and a lot of time to make those big ones. The big wall hangings, are li they're actually carrying baskets, if you didn't realise it, you literally fold them in half to carry things. It become a wall hanging, because like, they're just so beautiful obviously, but yeah. <laughs> The, um, the, the, it does take a lot of time to do this. So most of your time is spent, you know, and, and uh, most things are shared with everybody, but tools and weapons were, uh, still are the really personal items that you take great care in making. And, um, you know, I, I really enjoyed making all sorts of, um, especially if I can get my hands on mulga, it's a really just beautiful looking timber. Um, but, you know, making, making all of your, the things, um, some of you will be familiar with Darawal country. This is uh, just the southern end of the, um, of the Royal National Park, second oldest national park in the world, no doubt. Um, but yeah, lots of fresh water. It would have been really quite uh, something to be living around this area. Similar to um, Bunjilung country where we've got lots of rainforest. We still thankfully have remnant rainforest, but impacted heavily by a lot of farming. Um, but you know, lots of different waterfalls. If you've ever been up on Bunjilung country, the top end, you can go up into Lamington National Park and natural arch, just some amazing fresh water holes and right, um, waterfalls and all sorts of things. Um, I did the Wadi Wadi track about two weeks ago. This year is going to be off the Richter for wildflowers, so get out into them, enjoy it. Um, yeah, I still can't understand why people take waratahs out of the bush, but hey. Yeah, there are wildflower growers, people. But I'm preaching to the converted. I don't have to tell you guys any of this. Um, but yeah, if you if you think of it, you know, this is one of the freshwater um, waterfalls up in, up in the national park. It's just you know, there's some really beautiful places around the Illawarra. But you know, this sort of landscape, it, it's it's interesting because you know, up home we're we're on a salt waterfall. Um, Darawal is not that different in that you know, there's saltwater people, there's freshwater people. There's also, they, they also refer to bitter water people, the people that are sort of in the middle, well, the brackish water when the salt meets the fresh, etc. So, you know, the, uh, out west, they, they do call themselves freshwater people. Further west you go, there's desert people. But um, some of the freshwater people in the west of New South Wales refer to themselves as muddy water people. And, <laughs> and so, <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's, you know, I don't know. I don't know whether it's 
being brought up on the coast, but I, I, I still find it hard to eat freshwater fish, but it's just me, maybe, I don't know. Um, but, you know, the, you can imagine how difficult it would have been to, to um, hunt in places like this. Um, and I did know uh, that the previous speaker did, did mention um, Bill Gamage's book, The like, great, Greatest Estate on Earth. Yeah, um, and yeah, there, there were occasions when Aboriginal people used fire to quite literally herd animals into certain areas. So there's little bits and little things that are, you know, when I was, again, when I was growing up, you know, if we went diving for oysters, my, you know, I mentioned this to someone the other day, like as a kid, you just get the shits because Pop tells you, you know, after you've dived down to the bottom and you grab this rock and you, Halfway up, and you can't even get a breath. You go back down, you move it a bit further, and finally get it up. And then you know, Pop's taking a few oysters off, and he leaves half on the rock, and then he sends you straight back down again. Because if you leave it out, it's just gonna, all the oysters are gonna be dead. But as a kid, you think, oh man, you know what it took me to get that rock up here? <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna put it back here. Anyway, but you know, there's really simple things that you, know, uh, you don't really, as a, certainly growing up, you don't really think of it as cultural knowledge. You just think everyone sort of does this sort of stuff. But you know, learning to read, the, you know, as a saltwater follower, learning to read where pippies might be or where sea worms are, and you know, how to catch sea worms, which my grandmother was probably the greatest exponent of that. I was hopeless, but you know, every, uh, probably one in 10, she was pretty, she, you know, none of this pliers business, just using your fingers and a little bit of pippy bait. And, anyway, you know, but I remember going to the beach once and it started raining and then, you know, my uncle grabbed the, walked out in the bush and he came back with all this dry firewood. I was like, where did you get that firewood? Started a fire and had a little cook up. And what he and my father and you know, the dad's one of ten, so there's a few of us used to end up at the beach. But they they would dig pits in the ground and they would leave dry firewood because we would know we'd be coming back there. And it's you know, one one of those things. I'm not a big fan of the term fire stick farming, but I'm definitely no fan of the word walkabout. I don't know where that came from, but you know, people people do move around in their in their respective areas, and they still do it, particularly in remote communities. They have you know, summer camps and winter camps. Um, a lot of times they're living in town or they're on the in the community, but they will go back out on country and they'll they'll go and camp out there for a couple of weeks at a time. But you know, traditionally Aboriginal people literally followed the seasons, and it's not like you know, going into the bush just haphazardly and then finding it, this looks like a good place to set up camp. Those camps that were used for thousands of years, like if you find a good spot, you just stick to it. And particularly around the Sydney Basin, there's sandstone shelters everywhere. And there's a lot of work that um, certainly uh, people like Dale Attenborough and a lot of the, lot of the archeologists around, around um, certainly that era, um, dating a lot of the, the um, artifacts in a lot of the rock shelters. Um, there are some that probably don't even, you know, well, they're, they're around, but they're on private property, so nobody, you know, really knows what's in them or how old they are. But, um, you know, the, a lot of the, the rock engravings, they, they were part of ceremony, so, you know, it's not like you just do them once. The reason they were still visible after, you know, a few hundred or a few thousand years is because a particular ceremony would occur and that stone would be regrouped or be part of that ceremony to you know care for it so you have custodianship and different families have custodianship of different places and different um, jobs assigned to them so you know moving around through this kind of landscape now it's a tough gig um and you know again i'm not an expert in this area but I am a black fella who's grown up with uh, a little bit of cultural knowledge and you know, you would have to think that, you know, although I know a lot about bush tucker and, you know, our ancestors would have known the bush so well, they would have known exactly what to eat, what time of the year it's going to be fruiting. You know, a lot of the, the old aunties that I've, I've worked with in the um, territory, they, every, every one of them, every time they go to pick something off a tree or a bush, they will ask permission from the plant. It's one of the most beautiful things. They just do it all the time. And they, they don't even think about it. And half the time, you, 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 
you know, you just, they're just talking away to the plant. I'm sure some of you do as well. I know I do. <laughs> but it's, you know, they're, they're, they're talking to the plant. It's just such a beautiful thing to, to actually ask permission of that, of that plant for some of the food that it's going to give to you. And always leaving some so that the, that, that fruit can drop and the seed can replenish the bush naturally. Um, but yeah, yeah, look, protein would have been, by and large, the, the, the number one, and particularly in the desert country, but even on the coast, there's not a lot. Um, there's a few things. Um, you know, this is a this, this is actually up on uh, Wadi Wadi track a couple of uh, actually no, I think it was last year. Can't remember. I go up there so often. It's just so, so such a nice place. Um, but you know, making things like this, um, this is a, a contemporary structure that uh, myself and a few of my colleagues put together. Um, but you know, this took uh, well the gathering of the of the resources takes the longest. Um, getting enough paper bark um, and making sure that you, uh, you know, you're not taking too many layers off, the, off each tree. Um, and then, of course, also, given that we have an issue with myrtle rust these days, making sure that there is no myrtle rust visible so that you're not carting it anywhere. Um, but yeah, it took, uh, just trying to think how many of us there were, there were 10 of us. It took 10 of us all day, and this is this, when we had all the, all the materials um, and, and we, you know, to construct something this big. It was a beautiful, really cool structure. We did this for uh, Mother's Day at Barangaroo. Um, and in case you're wondering, um, we did have to get it uh, signed off by an engineer. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, so I had to... I had to cut up, I, I, I hand, hand sketched the design and then thought, oh, you know, we'll just use, you know, um, 200 mil star pickets, we'll get them into the ground and then we'll attach it. And then, you know, we used bamboo because it was much easier, but, you know, traditionally it would have, would have been green boughs. Um, but yeah, we, we had to get it signed off. And in answer to your next question, $1,100 is what it costs to get that uh, certificate. <laughs> But it was good for seven days, so it was in. We knew exactly what we had to do. Um, we put a little hole in the roof just so, the, and there's a hole at the back as well because if the wind had it picked up, it would have, the wind could actually pass through it. But, you know, it, it, but yeah, it's, it's super cozy. It was a really cool little thing. But these are some of the things that, you know, particularly if you haven't got you know, the um, benefit of places like Sydney where you've got rock, rock shelters everywhere. Um, if anyone's been in Mutawindji, some of the rock shelters out there are just phenomenal. And the, the rock art out there, it tells its own story about how to get to certain places, how to find water holes, where the shelters are. So again, you know, that whole thing about walkabout is just a really, I don't know where it came from. It's like, oh yeah, they just get up and they just walk off. But yeah, but they know where they're going. They know exactly where they're going. So you, know, you, you go, <laughs> Yeah. And again, you know, that, that whole thing of, you know, if you, when you leave that, that particular campsite, if you're going somewhere else, you always stop it so that, you know, the next time you get there it might be, in, you know, howling wind and pouring rain. You get there, you know, you've done it yourselves, I'm sure. Well, it's only your kids that do it, you know. Who used that? Why, why is it not back there? Who used the last one? Anyway, we didn't have that problem traditionally because it was, you know, there was rules. Follow the rules. Um, but yeah, some of the, the plants, you, you're probably familiar with a lot of these. Um, I mostly put these in because I just love the flowers, they're lovely. But the um, two different uses, the um, dendrobiums, the Sydney rock orchid is edible. Um, it is quite nice to eat. Um, it's mostly starch. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm a sucker for the, for the orchids, so you know, they're beautiful flowers. The, um, because because you normally have them outside, I had I had two rather large pots of orchids in a foyer uh, two years ago, and it was the first time I'd, I'd had them in a in closed space, and the perfume was like whoa, because you just not you, unless you get up close to the flower, you don't really think too much about it. But yeah, the perfume was unbelievable. So now I, when they're flowering, sometimes I bring them inside to suck. So. Um, Indigophora australis, the native indigo. It was, um, we use it a lot in our, our garden designs because, as you know, it's a nitrogen fixer. Um, but traditionally, this is a plant that was used for dyeing. Um, so if you do, if you're doing um, 
pretty much most of your weaving if you want to use different colours. Um, a lot of the, the weaving and, and a lot of the fibre plants that are used in the top end and across into far north Queensland, there are different plants that you use not only for the fibre but also for the colouring and a lot of them are um, root um, plants or, or the roots of particular plants. Um, we're lucky here that the indigo offer is a, it, it, is a really easy dye to use because you literally just crush up all the branches and leaves. Um, but yeah, this was, uh, you will no doubt know, they're all fruiting at the moment if you get out in the bush. Um, this is uh, Rubus parvifolius, there's also Rubus rosifolius, there's quite a few of the native um, raspberries but we're very lucky this season they've just been, they just haven't stopped, they've been going for like three months. They're almost finished, but you know, I'm gonna, I've got to seriously think about pulling them out. They're in their own bed, but they're already just too much trouble. Yeah, it's the trouble when you look so beautiful. All right, um, macadamia nuts. You would know about um, the fact that South Africa produced the most macadamia nuts in the world. We, we're way behind commercially at least. But um, an East Coast rainforest plant, it's certainly my mob. Um, if you've been up around Byron, there's a lot of macadamia nut farms. But we, um, as a kid, I remember, you know, there, there were wild macadamias just growing out in the bush. Um, bush limes, finger limes, uh, there was still, you know, still the odd um, rainforest plant here and there. Uh, yeah, they, 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 they do have a fairly wide range, but you know, they, are, they are hard to find in north, northern New South Wales. Way easier to find up in the Daintree and up in far north Queensland. Um, the, I threw the one on the, the right, that's actually an orange berry. It's not, it doesn't grow down here, but it's a, it's a, if you do get a chance to eat it, it's, it's such a beautiful berry. You can grow down here. This one's growing out at Mount Anna Botanic Garden. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, I always forget the name of it. Gly. Yes. Thank you. Yes. That's the one. Yes. Thank you. So, oh, sorry. Glycosmos, the big fruit of lime berry. Yeah. Multifolia? Something folia? Yeah. Litifolia. Yeah, thank you. All right. <laughs> we'll, we'll make notes of these. <laughs> um, uh, down here, my, uh, my friends from Buddha will uh, know this term, snotty gobble. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, it's a, a, uh, it, it's a uh, the cherry ballard. It's a much nicer word than snotty gobble, but um, cherry ballast, they're, they're all starting to fruit at the moment too, but it's a, you know, it's, it's a really amazing plant, but it's one of the tastiest fruits that I, I, you know, I, I like it a lot. Um, but you know, there are a lot of plants, you know, there are thousands as you all know, thousands of native plants just in the Sydney basin. I think you know, when, when I was working at the gardens, we tried to come up with a number and it's probably around the 2000 mark just for the Sydney region on plants that were either used for food or for medicine. Um, I was talking to Mike earlier, um, you know, I'll, go to, I'll say good day to Mike later, he asking about uh, wattle seed. And wattle seed is a, um, you know, it, it makes a great damp, but you need a lot of it. And it takes a long time. The wattles are blooming their heads off at the moment, so yeah. we have to wait for the seed to come. Um, don't eat green wattle seed, that's all I can say. Um, but you know, um, similarly, you may or may not recognise the flower on the right. Um, Bolwara, well done. The, uh, there is one fruit, I just noticed that too, but they're yeah, beautiful flower. Um, native guava, some people say guava, I say guava. Um, but either way, um, that's just you know, growing up with uh, a lot of cousins, we all say guava. We also say castle. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Not that we have one, um, but uh, there is a, a, a disclaimer with the bolwara. Um, and if you've ever eaten one, they've got to be yellow, obviously they've got to be ripe. Um, but you shouldn't eat the seeds. The seeds are psychoactive. Ooh. Well, maybe you should eat the seeds. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just saying, you're not supposed to eat the seeds. But if you've ever eaten a bolwara, they're nothing but seed. <laughs> But um, they are tasty, I must say. Um, but yeah, these are just some of the plants. Um, I, I did, 
That's all the Pogans out on the table. Um, this, I just chucked this here because I was out on Durrell Country last week, and uh, as I said, this season is just going to be insane. On um, just just seeing what's already blooming and just the number of species that are just going nuts from all the rain. Um, and interesting how people have forgotten about the, the bushfires already. It's just, yeah. You know, it's all been about the floods, which you know, rightly so. It's been damaging, certainly up home. Um, you know, Lismore's been smashed. You know, Byron, I've never seen Byron flood, but anyway, there you go. Um, but yeah, the, it, it's interesting. A lot of the, a lot of the plants that that are in the Australian bush, and particularly around this area in the Greater Sydney region, lots and lots of, of beautiful colours. Not a lot of food plants. There are a lot of tubers, um, a lot of root, um, well, yeah, I suppose they're root vegetables. Um, there's a lot of work that um, Uncle Bruce Pascoe and Black Duck Foods are doing down on the south coast, um, particularly around the native grains. Um, it's, it, it, it's interesting that there, he's, 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 for some reason, he's attracted a lot of detractors. Yeah, attracted a lot of detractors, um, which is very strange because all he's done is, is put pulled together historical documents to, you know, as most people do when they're writing a scientific paper or they're putting something together, you just take the material you've got and you put it all together. So, you know, it's pretty easy to see. As I said, there's a lot of, you know, it, that, those simple things like the aunties just asking the plant and leaving fruit for the next generation of seed to come through. Like that, that in itself is a way of environmental management. Uh, as are middens. Most of you have heard about middens. So middens are a 3D log, if you will, of what people are eating. Now I'm flat out knowing what I had last week, let alone what I had six months ago. So if you go to a particular camp um, ground where you know, there's a midden, you can tell what you or the other mob ate last time they were there. So you try and you know, literally work your way, way through different um, food sources so that you don't you know, exhaust those resources. Um, these are some of the, the you know, I had to throw the Waratah in, you know, why not? Um, this is last season uh, up in the Blue Mountains, so it's a, it's a ring in. But there are plenty around um, the Yellow Wara as well. That, um, the other image over there is up on the back of the Wadi Wadi track. But as I was saying, you know, lots of fresh water. It's a, you know, right out, you know, thermal the lakes. You keep going, going west on Darawal country, you go south on Darawal country. It would have been a fairly, you know, well, when I say easy, it would have been a, a relatively easy uh, task to get through your day-to-day -day, um, operations of, of literally finding food. Find, you know, find, finding shelter wasn't so tough because everyone, you know, as I said, people moved around. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of different books that have been written by um, particularly older um, or you know, Aboriginal people who, who are no longer with us. Uh, one of them is um, the, uh, called the Red Warrior. Um, it's about the Gunnedah tribe, and it's a it's a it's a really beautiful account of of traditional life and um, you know how, how you you know you, the easy part is the well not the easy part but the you know knowing knowing your you know, that, that our totemic systems and our connection to particular animals and birds and fish and plants and that in itself gives you the knowledge I suppose of when that thing is fruiting or when that thing is breeding or when it's around, when it's not around. You know, some of the, the mosaic burning to encourage new growth so that, you know, it's going to be easier, to, way easier to hunt kangaroos and wallabies when you know, fire's taking the grass from this side down to the ground. So, you know, there's some really clever stuff that our ancestors knew about the bush. Um, strangely enough, I was at a cultural burn Tuesday just gone in regional Victoria. So, you know, learning learning a little bit about what happens in other on Aboriginal country. Um, and when we refer to Aboriginal country, my country is Bundjalung. I love visiting other country, and you know, um, Thurrell is no no different. I, I love living down here. Um, but, but again, I, I can't speak for country. But you know, what's not to, not to like about the yellow? It's just so beautiful. There's a nice little. Uh, um, sunset peak over the mountain. Um, you know, there's a few buildings on the left, but we'll see. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a it, it's an interesting um, you know a day in the life. It's literally get up as early as you can so that you can try and get out and get some food early. Um, then you know, the rest of your days either you know, making things or 
prepping things, getting ready for the afternoon. You might be able to go out hunting again on sunset, or you might, you know, go out dogging. And, and anyone who's ever, uh, I grew up, my, most of my family are fishermen and farmers. So, and when Dad was a professional fisherman, he knew exactly when you, when the best time to go fishing. You know, no one goes fishing at midday. What's the point? No one goes hunting at midday. It's too hot. So yeah, you, know, you just those little windows early in the day and then late late in the afternoon. So the rest of the time is yours. Yeah? And as uh, John would say, yeah, we work all our lives to retire. Wouldn't you want to do it the other way around? <laughs> so yeah, um, hopefully I haven't gone over time. I haven't been keeping track. I should have put it on my phone to know exactly what time it was. It would have beeped and everything. Yeah, I think I'm on time. <laughs> so just to wrap up, I'll, I will say in the in the thorough language, "wada o dari nana malaygamiye," which you would normally say at the beginning of the speech, but in the Sydney language, they also say "didjurugo," which is "thank you." very much Clarence that was fantastic I think what I loved about that most was the experiences and the drawing on the history and the stories which are so powerful for, for all of us um, who would who has a question for Clarence there we go in the middle of the room there I'm a Taurus I like <laughs> going out <laughs> Hello, my name is Phoenix. I'm a local. Uh, you talked about, oh, you mentioned the 1st of September, start of spring. Now, I was reading that many Aboriginal people had six seasons. Do you know a little bit more about that? And can you tell us? <laughs> um, yes, I do. <laughs> but it, it varies. Yeah, there is a thorough seasonal, seasonal calendar that you can have a look at. Um, up north, there's just two seasons. There's the wet season and the dry season. Um, and the build-up, and if you've ever experienced the build-up, oh, you know, it's interesting. But yeah, that that if you, there's, there's a lot of different. I think the um, you can't say bomb anymore. The Bureau of Meteorology have um, a, a specific page for seasonal calendars. So if you go onto the website, you can see there's, there's quite a few different ones. But yeah, it, by and large, they they do seem for some reason to wrap around the number, you know, six different seasons. But um, up in Kakadu, they have they've also got a six season calendar, um, and but it's they, they, they it's really clever the way they've done. It's like a it's like a circle inside a circle inside a circle, so that you can move one. Well, you, if you if you did it as a three D thing, you could actually move one circle, and that lines up with the other circle. If something if something's happening in the environment, you move the outer circle. And then it lines up with the inner circle, so that the season doesn't always start at a particular time. It's always reliant on what's happening with all the other animals and plants and these you know, birds in particular. So that you know, it, 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 for whatever reason, it's mostly six. There's a um, couple I don't know that are eight. Um, there are some that have four, but yeah, you know, there's again up north, there's just two. More questions? Here we go down the front. different language groups know where their borders were? Oh, the waters, did you say? Their borders. Oh, borders. Um, it was a fairly loose arrangement, shall we say. <laughs> um, but it was, it, it, it all relates to the dreaming stories. So the dream, like if you, and, and it's why Aboriginal people in particular, Torres Strait Islanders were a, a little more warlike. Um, they won't mind me saying that because they take great pride in the fact that they were warriors, their ancestors were warriors. For Aboriginal people, there were skirmishes, there were uh, disagreements, um, but it was generally over women. Um, <laughs> it was, good reason. Uh, it was a very good reason, but it was but it, it, primarily because you, your, your, your gene pool was quite small. If you look at a clan, mm. you know, clans aren't that big. So you had to marry 
someone of the right skin. Um, and we have different skin groups, we have different moieties, and I haven't got enough time to go into the intricacies, but you have, like my, my, um, my northern um, Australian moiety is Dua, and in northern Australia you have Dua and Yiritja. Dua can't marry Dua. Dua has to marry Yiritja. So there's, uh, to, there's, to keep your bloodline strong. So there's all these, and by and large, most Aboriginal groups have two different moieties to make that marriage line strong mm-hmm. and that bloodline strong. But, the, you know, it's as far as borders, and that's why they didn't wage war to take on somebody's country, mm-hmm. because if you don't know the dreaming stories about caring for country, you can't care for country. So what's the point in me making my kingdom bigger? It's pointless. Mm-hmm. If I can have a quick second question. Um, do you know how these different 300 or 700 languages evolved and if they as they apparently have was the one language very similar to the mob next door no that's, that's a good question they're they're, they're, they're really different um, and you know if, if I think of um, Bunjala and Gumbangi which are with neighbours um, Gumbangi is, is way different to Bunjala but within Bunjalung, um, and so we have we have diff- different words for you know, mother, father, brother, okay. sister, um, and there's a word. So um, Bijang is in the south of Bunjalung is father, but Biyang in the north of Bunjalung is father. So if you say Bijang in the north, it means small, but if you say Bijang in the south, it means father. Like there's some really interesting little nuances of our language um, but I like to say that you know if uh, the French were five days quicker we'd be all speaking French and writing Aboriginal languages in French rather than English so it might have been easier to actually say the, the Sydney I, I, I'd say spend a lot of time with the, the Sydney language I just I love all languages I've been lucky to travel to communities where I've learnt songs from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities and just really um, it, 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 learning it through song is a really easy way to remember language. Um, I actually I do that with plants too, so I can remember botanic names. But um, <laughs> that's just the way I learn things. Um, but the, the, it, learning learning those different language groups, it, the, there are crossovers, but a lot of time it's just it's just by by complete fluke. So you might have heard about message sticks. Most you know, if you wanted to pass a message to the neighbouring tribe. Generally, there was somebody who's married into that tribal group or that clan group. So there's normally somebody who can speak both languages. Um, this is, of course, traditionally speaking. Um, even now, though, there's you know, up, up north, there's you know, um, one of the, the girls that um, I know quite well from Cookie Yalanji. They, they, you know, there's Cookie Yalanji. There's a couple of different groups. Cookie means means people of. So Cookie Yalanji are the people of the rainforest. And there's, so there's, I can't, can't remember them all, but they, there's like five different language groups and she can, she can't speak them all fluently, but she knows words out of about three of those five. And that's the case with a lot of different places. That, you know, but a message stick, or you've seen Aboriginal art, the message stick normally has that, those symbols that everybody understood. So you're able to just pass a message stick and you could get the message to somebody really, really quickly and easily. Here we go, down here. Did I see any others down here? Hello, my name's Donna from West Australia. I was wondering about um, Aboriginal art. When a, a tribe went into a cave, would you touch up the art to make it more visible or did you leave it as it was? Um, no, good question. The, uh, most, mostly it was, it, it was through ceremony that those Little touch up, I suppose, is a good term as any. Um, but the um, I don't know if anyone's, I forget what it's called up there, Ben Buckler, um, above Ben Buckler in the golf course. Um, anyway, if you've been to the on Military Road, there's a there's a set of rock engravings that are in the middle of the golf course. You literally just park your car and you walk onto the whatever it is, tenth tee or something, tenth green. And there's a massive rock platform, and the what is that? The Waverley Council, I think. Back in the '60s, they thought it would be a good idea to regroup them so you could see them better. So, 
Um, thankfully, that doesn't happen anymore. Um, but you know, the reason why we can see it, particularly around Sydney, but um, you know, there, there are different forms of, of um, doing rock art, the, the different methods. But a lot of time, it was part of ceremony. So, you know, and a lot of those ceremonies haven't been happening now for you know, certainly the past hundred years. But you know, they they, they were. A, a key or intrinsic part of ceremony that people would actually touch them up. Yeah. Any more questions up the back there? Thank you very much. Um, my name's Alan Griffin, actually. Um, why I'm uh, talking here today is about the uh, the rivers. I originally come from Ghana, and. Uh, over the years, the, um, the farmers have been taking our, our waters and also our uh, animals, our goannas, our koalas and all that. Now, our plants are all actually, big, just because the, um, just lately we just had a flood up in Canada around Tamworth and all that. But all I'm going to say is that uh, I'm disappointed in all the rivers, that, uh, especially the Mokome. Our rivers have been taken away, the farmers have been taking our water. And for me, it is, it's just a disgraceful thing to do. Our animals are dying, and our koalas, especially over the years, they've uh, have died for uh, you know, hundreds of them, have been living in Canada because there's no water up there. Just recently, just recently because of the floods, that's what's um, it saved the, the rivers up there. But over the years, the government has, hasn't done anything to help our rivers up around in that area. So that's all I'm going to say. Thank you very much. I might uh, follow him. And he, he's not planted in the audience, I, I assure you. <laughs> but. <laughs> so, I'm 100% with you, brother. This, the, the shirt I'm wearing is Say That Darling Barker. And the Barker is the river. The Barkanji are the people of the river. Um, and Uncle Badger Bates gave me the shirt because he's, he's, along with many other community members, out. Yeah, there is, and it's all of our rivers, not just the Murray Darling, but you know, there's you know, the, the, I, there's way, way too many things to go into. But you know, issuing licences for water that doesn't physically exist is a very, very strange, strange thing to do. And when it becomes a commodity that people can trade, and people who start off with a certain allocation, but then can buy other allocations and literally have a massive stockpile of, you know, what becomes, you know, a, a monetary thing. It's, it, you know, our, our environment, our, you know, and then it's all of us as Australians, not just, you know, us for, as First Nations people. My country has been heavily impacted, you know, we're, we're on the bottom edge of the Gold Coast. So, you know, all the places that were mangrove swamps are now, you know, canal estates, with the high rises, so you know we've got a borer ring at, at Palm Beach that you know it's surrounded by houses and there's a highway screaming past it. You know, but it's like, ah, oh, you know, the local people they've still got their borer ground. It's like, yeah, it's nice, but you know, it would be nicer if it was surrounded by bush. Anyway, I'm with you. <laughs> You know, man, Todd from Sydney, I don't mean to take away from that one bit, but the Bawara plant, I tap them to grow a lot of them. I'm just wondering, do they taste nice or do you just think they taste nice? <laughs> <laughs> well, after I uh, ingested the seeds, they tasted better. But, uh, <laughs> no, I, well, I, I like Bawara, so, you know, I, the, the Bawara, it, it's like, um, G-bums are, are probably a, a good example, like, now people ask if you can eat G-bums, but G-bum is there's a tiny window when the G-bum tastes good. And if you're either, either side of that window, they taste like crap. It's like kangaroo apple, you know, like, you know, they're part of the Solomacy family, so they'll kill you if you don't look out. But, you know, if, if you've ever, has anyone ever eaten kangaroo apples? Yeah? Yeah, you, you, you all know what I'm talking about. Like, when they get super ripe, they are disgusting but, but you know green they're no good either but there's that there's that, and this is the same with a lot of our native native foods is that you know and you've got to hand it to all those, those old fellas they they you know they had an intrinsic knowledge of all of those plants and it was by necessity you had to know and yeah you know, um classic examples of the um, butterwings. 
So there are psych ads that the South Coast mob ate, but they knew that they had to process them first. They had to take the toxins out, and it was a long process. I didn't touch on it here, but you know, there's a, there's a lot of those things. If you you know, if you've ever gathered, gathered um, acacia seed, you know, you, you need thousands of them. But the the um, butter wings, you know, you only need about ten, and you can make a decent paste. So you know, going through the processing and storing it ready to eat is way easier than spending you know a couple of days getting wattle seed. So, yeah. Last question from last question from me. If there were one or two things that you think these people could do to help conserve, grow, extend native plants and their ecology and the environment, what, what would that be? I, I, again, I think I'm in the in the, the room of, of uh, people that already know what to do. It's, um, yeah, it's 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 that that appreciation of plants, but understanding you know. For, for you know, so many of the Aboriginal mobs, we we, we have a connection to country, and and we you know, even even though this is not my country, I, I feel connected to the, these spaces, and I want to do my best as somebody who is literally a visitor on country to care for this country as much as I do when I go home, and I think everyone, if everyone has that same mindset of looking after it. Then you know we can we can get there. Like we had a, a perfect opportunity after the last bushfires to just have a just launch a massive volunteer army into the bush and make sure that the weeds didn't come back. But yeah, you know, we, we 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 didn't. And now the you know, now it's, if you look around now now we've had heaps of rain and you know, the weeds are going just as good as the rest of the plants out there. So yeah, you know, there's a lot of invasive species. There's a lot of a lot of things happening. We can't stop development. You know, part of the work that I do with my company is trying to change the, the, the idea of, of what a landscape garden should look like. Um, moving away from exotics. I only, I only do designs with native species, trying to build plant communities and bring back urban biodiversity because we're, we're going to be in deep shit if we don't start to really think about what we're doing to the planet and you know we can learn from thousands of years of knowledge and you know get out in your local area meet the local mobs who, who live and work around where you are they had that connection to country and they had that knowledge um you know i'm probably on the same note as the what the farmers do to the water the, there are international patents now on so many of our native species it's it's, it's a crime but it's it's allowed to happen because you know, the, uh, I won't mention Mary Kay Cosmetics, but there's a large corporation who have a patent in on Kakadu Plum. So if they are granted that that um, patent, then you know, there's another company who have a Gumby Gumby, which is is the, an Aboriginal language name for a particular plant that they found is you know, has these medicinal qualities. The company now has the copyright on Gumby Gumby. And it, 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 like so, the local mob don't have access to a language name of a plant. It's just you know, there's literally thousands of patents out at the moment waiting to be granted on our native species. And there are, you know, as you all know, there are thousands of plants. And a lot of times, you know, Aboriginal people in you know, their caring and sharing way give information to certain people. That information finds its way to people who realise they can make a buck. So they go in hard and they go in and just make it really difficult for local communities. But you know, that's just one small issue that we have as Aboriginal people. There are so many others. But I think just you know, looking at what we can do for the environment, you know, climate change is real. Um, that hunt guy, you know, I... Um, <laughs> Whatever your whatever your your uh, political persuasion, you know, there. Um, my good mate who won uh, the Archibald this year made up some T-shirts in two thousand and seven um, that said John Hunt is still a coward. <laughs> so it kind of sums it up. If you enjoyed this presentation, then please subscribe to our channel. Other presentations from the conference are available in this playlist, with new ones being added all the time.